is how much will a project cost? The question is not how much will it cost? Do we have the resources? And we have the resources today to house everyone, build hospitals all over the world, build schools all over the world, the finest equipment and labs for teaching and doing medical research. So you see, we have all that, but we're in a monetary system. And in a monetary system, there's profit. And what is the fundamental mechanism that drives the profit system besides self-interest? What is it exactly that maintains that competitive edge at its core? Is it high efficiency and sustainability? No, that isn't part of their design. Nothing produced in our profit-based society is even remotely sustainable or efficient. If it was, there wouldn't be a multi-million dollar a year service industry for automobiles. Nor would the average lifespan for most electronics be less than three months before they're obsolete. Is it abundance? Absolutely not. Abundance, as based on the laws of supply and demand, is actually a negative thing. If a diamond company finds ten times the usual amount of diamonds during their mining, it means the supply of diamonds has increased, which means the cost and profit per diamond drops. The fact is, efficiency, sustainability, and abundance are enemies of profit. To put it into a word, it is the mechanism of scarcity that increases profits. What is scarcity? Based on keeping products valuable, slowing up production on oil raises the price. Maintaining scarcity of diamonds keeps the price high. They burn diamonds at the Kimberley diamond mines. that made of carbon. That keeps the price up. So then, what does it mean for society when scarcity, either produced naturally or through manipulation, is a beneficial condition for industry? It means that sustainability and abundance will never ever occur in a profit system for it simply goes against the very nature of the structure. Therefore, it is impossible to have a world without war or poverty. It is impossible to continually advance technology to its most efficient and productive states. And most dramatically, it is impossible to expect human beings to behave in truly ethical or decent ways. People use the word instinct because they can't account for the behavior. They sit back and they evaluate with their lack of knowledge, you know, and they say things like, humans are built a certain way, greed is a natural thing, as though they've worked for years on it, and it's no more natural than wearing clothing. What we want to do is to eliminate the causes of the problems eliminate the processes that, that produce greed and bigotry and prejudice and um, people taking advantage of one another and elitism, eliminating the need for prisons and welfare. We have always had these problems because we have always lived within scarcity and barter and monetary systems that produce scarcity. If you eradicate the conditions that generate what you call socially offensive behavior, it does not exist. The guy said, well, isn't that inborn? No, it's not. There is no human nature. There's human behavior, and that's always been changed throughout history. You're not born with bigotry and greed and corruption and hatred. You, you pick that up within the society. War, poverty, corruption, hunger, misery, human suffering will not change in a monetary system. That is, there'll be very little significant change. It's going to take the redesign of our culture, our values, and it has to be related to the carrying capacity of the earth, not some human opinion or some politician's notions of the way the world ought to be, or some religious notions of the conduct of human affairs. And that's what the Venus Project is about. The society that we're about to talk about is a society that is free of all the old superstitions, incarceration,
prisons, police, cruelty, and law. All laws will disappear, and the professions will disappear that are no longer valid, such as stockbrokers, bankers, advertising, gone forever, because it's no longer relevant. When we understand that it is technology devised by human ingenuity which frees humanity and increases our quality of life, we then realize that the most important focus we can have is on the intelligent management of the Earth's resources. For it is from these natural resources we gain the materials to continue our path of prosperity. Understanding this, we then see that money fundamentally exists as a barrier to these resources for virtually everything has a financial cost. And why do we need money to obtain these resources? Because of real or assumed scarcity. We don't usually pay for air and tap water because it is in such high abundance selling it would be pointless. So then, logically speaking, if resources and technologies applicable to creating everything in our societies, such as houses, cities and transportation, were in high enough abundance, there would be no reason to sell anything. Likewise, if automation and machinery was so technologically advanced as to relieve human beings of labor, there would be no reason to have a job. And with these social aspects taken care of, there would be no reason to have money at all. So the ultimate question remains. Do we on earth have enough resources and technological understanding to create a society of such abundance that everything we have now could be available without a price tag and without the need for submission through employment? Yes, we do. We have the resources and technology to enable this at a minimum, along with the ability to raise the standard of living so high that people in the future will look back at our civilization now and gawk at how primitive and immature our society was. What the Venus Project proposes is an entirely different system that's updated to present day knowledge. We've never given scientists the problem of how do you design a society which would eliminate boring and monotonous jobs, that would eliminate accidents in transportation, that would enable people to have a high standard of living, that would eliminate poisons in our food, that would give us other sources of energy that are clean and efficient. We can do that out there. The major difference between a resource-based economy and a monetary system is that a resource-based economy is really concerned with people and their well-being, where a monetary system has become so distorted that the concerns of the people are really secondary, if they're there at all. The products that are turned out are for how much money you can get. If there is a problem in society and you can't earn money from solving that problem, then it won't be done. The resource-based economy is really not close to anything that's been tried. And with all our technology today, we can create abundance. It could be used to improve everyone's lifestyle. Abundance all over the world if we use our technology wisely and maintain the environment. It's a very different system, and it's very hard to talk about because the public is not that well enough informed as to the state of technology. At present, we don't have to burn fossil fuels. We don't have to use anything that would contaminate the environment. There are many sources of energy available. Alternative energy solutions pushed by the establishment, such as hydrogen, biomass, and even nuclear, are highly insufficient, dangerous, and exist only to perpetuate the profit structure that industry has created. When we look beyond the propaganda and self-serving solutions put forth by the energy companies, we find a seemingly endless stream of clean, abundant and renewable energy for generating power. Solar and wind energy are well known to the public, but the true potential of these mediums remains unexpressed. Solar energy, derived from the sun, has such abundance that one hour of light at high noon contains more energy than what the entire world consumes in a year. If we could capture one hundredth of a percent of this energy, the world would never have to use oil, gas or anything else. 
The question then is not availability, but the technology to harness it. And there are many advanced mediums today which could accomplish just that, if they were not hindered by the need to compete for market share with the established energy power structures. Then there's wind energy. Wind energy has long been denounced as weak and due to being location driven, impractical. This is simply not true. The US Department of Energy admitted in 2007 that if wind was fully harvested in just three of America's 50 states, it could power the entire nation. And then there are the rather unknown mediums of tidal and wave power. Tidal power is derived from tidal shifts in the ocean. Installing turbines which capture this movement generates energy. In the United Kingdom, 42 sites are currently noted as available forecasting that 34% of all the UK's energy could come from tidal power alone. Wave power, which extracts energy from the surface motions of the ocean, is estimated to have a global potential of up to 80,000 terawatt hours a year. This means 50% of the entire planet's energy usage could be produced from this medium alone. Now, it is important to point out that tidal, wave, solar, and wind power requires virtually no preliminary energy to harness, unlike coal, oil, gas, biomass, hydrogen, and all the others. In combination, these four mediums alone, if efficiently harnessed through technology, could power the world forever. That being said, there happens to be another form of clean, renewable energy which trumps them all. Geothermal power. Geothermal energy utilizes what is called heat mining, which, through a simple process using water, is able to generate massive amounts of clean energy. In 2006, an MIT report on geothermal energy found that 13,000 zettajoules of power are currently available in the Earth, with the possibility of 2,000 zettajoules being easily tappable with improved technology. The total energy consumption of all the countries on the planet is about half of a zettajoule a year. This means about 4,000 years of planetary power could be harnessed in this medium alone. And when we understand that the Earth's heat generation is constantly renewed, this energy is really limitless and could be used forever. These energy sources are only a few of the clean, renewable mediums available. And as time goes on, we will find more. The grand realization is that we have total energy abundance without the need for pollution, traditional conservation, or in fact, a price tag. And what about transportation? The prevailing means of transportation in our societies is by automobile and aircraft, both of which predominantly need fossil fuels to run. In the case of the automobile, the battery technology needed to power an electric car that can go over 100 miles an hour for over 200 miles on one charge exists, and has existed for many years. However, due to battery patents controlled by the oil industry, which limits their availability to maintain market share, coupled with political pressure from the energy industry, the accessibility and affordability of this technology is limited. There is absolutely no reason other than pure, corrupt profit interest that every single vehicle in the world cannot be electric and utterly clean, with zero need for gasoline. As far as airplanes, it is time we realize that this means of travel is inefficient, cumbersome, slow, and causes far too much pollution. This is a maglev train. It uses magnets for propulsion. It is fully suspended by a magnetic field and requires less than 2% of the energy used for plane travel. The train has no wheels so nothing can wear out. The current maximum speed of versions of this technology, as used in Japan, is 361 miles per hour. However, this version of the technology is very dated. An organization called ET3, which has connections with the Venus Project, has established a tube-based maglev that can travel up to 4,000 miles per hour in a motionless, frictionless tube, which can go over land,